So in retrospect, I should have disclosed, I should have called the board and asked, hey, this happened, does this count? <laughs> and back then, um, I don't know if it was because maybe I was working for attorneys, I, I honestly don't remember, but I didn't do that. And so I said, no, I checked off no to those questions. And it took months for the board to get records. So that was uh, my residency program records, my mental health records. Um, at that point in time, I was, you know, I started seeing a mental health professional uh, to help with the anxiety of like, you know, this is going on and I'm not crazy. So it took several months for them to come back and say, no, you know, we, need, we, 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 we won't give you a, a license to practice medicine because you omitted information a and B, based on the information that you omitted, we don't know that you're not, you know, using substances anymore. Because I had had in my depression symptoms some substance use. So I guess I want to clarify that that is a difficult, you know, that is a and, and acknowledge that that's a difficult thing for anyone to admit to. But in retrospect, um, it would have been so much easier, you know, that would have saved me two plus years of worrying, <laughs> fretting, um, not being employed in medicine, basically. And ultimately, you know, it would have saved me some time in getting my license. So from what I've seen since then, so after that, you know, I did get a license, I worked a little bit, I figured out I love to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and just connect in that way. I went back to surgery, or I'm sorry, to psychiatry residency. I did a fellowship in addiction medicine um, or addiction psychiatry. And so since then, I mean, it's interesting that what, what happened then, so my establishing psychiatric care, learning how to take care of myself, going through evaluations, seeing what was going on around me, all that prepared me for what I do now, because I help clinicians that similarly are, are you know, being asked by the board to do an evaluation to help, help them come sometimes to terms with their diagnosis, their need to take care of themselves, they don't need to have accountability, right? As I mentioned in the article, sometimes when a disease is so advanced, when it's a mental health condition, um, like depression or severe substance use disorder, the part of our brain that just makes good decisions and can stay responsible and accountable isn't, isn't working as well. So we need those outside structures. And physicians phenomenally do well in such structured programs that we call monitoring. And I think Dr. Law's gonna discuss a little bit more specifics about that. But when you look at the literature, this is past 20 plus years, physicians who undergo monitoring for say alcohol use disorder that have been performing testing, perhaps doing groups, whatever it is that at that point in their disease cycle um, is required of them for treatment, they have I mean, they have abstinence rates of above 85%. It's usually in the 90s, but that's phenomenal. You can't go to any treatment center nowadays and get help for your alcohol or your drug problem and have those statistics. I mean, so that model works and it helps people build new skills. So um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the, the, um, the fear of, you know, lack of confidentiality. It's not just this state, it's many other states. Um, there have been, you know, mostly surveys uh, conducted. In the District of Columbia, for example, a survey in 2016 uh, for female physicians um, that went out to all 50 states, right? This study was, was originated in DC, um, found that only 6% of clinicians that had any sort of diagnosis or treatment for mental health issues actually disclosed it to their board. So again, people wanna hide it. People are afraid um, that that may impact their, their career. Uh, likewise, in 2009, there, were, uh, there was a postal survey of doctors' um, attitudes and fear was cited as a number one reason as to why uh, physicians were not seeking help for their mental illness. So there was fear of their impact on career, of being hospitalized, having to take time out, um, losing the license to practice, losing hospital privileges. And those are the things that I talk about in my practice every day. 
and a lot of people have unfortunately have to live through. But I do believe that things are changing. So as an example of that, and I believe Raquel's gonna speak to that directly, um, you know, medical boards have been attending their own continuing education sources, which include the Federation of Medical State Boards at a national level. Um, and there's, there's research coming out, you know, same stuff that I quoted and others that shows that this stigma and fear, again, are driving many people's illness to go undetected and worsen in severity over time. And so when I, I've personally seen our state attend those because I go to the Physician of um, the Federation of State Physician Health Programs conference. They're both held at the same time. And it's it's just nice to know that we're all working toward a, a, a change system where perhaps more clinicians can seek care. So if we have an addiction psychiatry in my field, we know that about 10% of the population will have a problem with mental health sub substance use disorders at some point in their life. Right. And if we have about between 22 to 25,000 licensed MDs in the state, but we only have about, you know, less than 100 that are being treated actively, we know there's a lot of people that are probably, uh, that have their disease undetected and are possibly not getting help um, for fear of some of these, these issues. So, Going back to what I'm what I'm talking about, that I've seen the board transition. I have sat through common lectures, you know, at FSMB and FSPHP, talking about you know, the questioning. How do you change questioning so that it's less invasive? How do you open discussion? How do you train staff? And it's very different, very different. Ten plus years later than when I was faced with you know my my questions and my having to explain it and then reapplying. I want to uh, also thank uh, a sponsor that we have for this talk and um, call out Mr. Ruben Lewis IV, who is with the National Financial Group. So um, they were very gracious to sponsor this discussion today. Uh, we'll add a link to the chat so that people can connect with Ruben Lewis with some contact information for him. And we'll get back to that uh, toward the end of the talk as well. Um, and if you have any questions for their organization, um, please reach out to us or connect directly with Mr. Lewis. So we're very thankful for their sponsorship and to Central Arizona AHEC. Um, Raquel, if you could pick it up from where Dr. Freya left off, um, what's the perspective of the Arizona Medical Board? Um, where are you right now with the investigations? Um, what, what advice would you have for our listeners? And then we can uh, turn to, Eric, to Dr. Locke as well. Raquel? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here and being a representative of the board. Um, so just for some context, if people aren't familiar with the PHP, that stands for Physician Health Program. Um, that's a state-sponsored program, or the board-sponsored program, uh, which includes multiple assessors and two monitors. And our mission really is to protect the public through uh, education, intervention, post-treatment monitoring, and support for allopathic physicians and also PAs, because we do share staff with both boards here. Um, who may suffer from health-related issues. So this could be substance use, dependence, uh, medical, psychiatric, behavioral, or psychological health issues that may impact their ability to safely practice medicine or perform healthcare tasks. Um, so Dr. Faria shared a good example um, in regard to her story about what happened when she applied for a license here. And I appreciate that she also touched on the fact that our license application question regarding uh, confidential health question had changed to be, um, and that was along the guidelines issued by the FSPHP, uh, so that people wouldn't be so fearful about disclosing any confidential health issues that they may have experienced. Um, so we did change the, the wording with the questionnaire to still get us the same information that we need to determine what we are going to do if there is a yes answer on an application. And one thing I want to make clear, since we were talking about Dr. Faria's um, initial application process is, um, and I think it's important for everyone to know here, residents um, and people from other states who are coming to get a license, is just because you disclose a yes answer does not automatically mean that you will not qualify for licensure. Um, a yes answer and providing 
documents such as your treating provider's records or a letter from your treating physician opining on your safety to practice. Uh, we get this information and then either the investigator or our chief consultant or a committee will make a recommendation or a decision to request that somebody undergo a PHP evaluation if they're not already licensed by us. So um, the person applying for a license now has the option to either refuse that, rec uh, that request to undergo the evaluation and have the board see their case as is, as well as their refusal to undergo the evaluation, or they can undergo the evaluation and they're notified um, that you know, once the evaluation is complete, a committee will review their case again and then make a recommendation for what action to take, but it's ultimately up to the board. So that's specific to the application process. And I just really thought it was important to note that a yes answer does not automatically mean that you are gonna be denied licensure. Um, it's really an opportunity for us to get any, in, uh, any relevant health information that we need just to make sure that the patients in Arizona are protected. Um, so in speaking with some changes that the PHP program has made, I would say in about 2018, um, we made some changes to our program. Um, so that means that we added multiple assessors for licensees located throughout the state to select somebody to perform their physician health evaluation. Um, these are doctors that are addiction psychiatrists or in addiction medicine or psychiatry um, with, with experience in um, addiction. And so those are our assessors. Uh, we have a list on our website that provides uh, licensees with information on who to contact, uh, where they're located, and what the cost of the assessments are if they're ordered to undergo an assessment or an evaluation. Um, and we also have two monitors, which is different from the past, where we had one monitor, uh, one monitor who was also the assessor. Um, so at this time, we have nine different assessors for licensees to select on their own who would they like to perform their evaluation. And we have two different monitors, uh, Community Bridges, as well as Gateway Recovery Institute. And um, so they are the ones who, after we put licensees on a board order for monitoring, whether it's interim or a final board order, um, the monitors are the ones who are actually following up, making sure they're meeting the requirements of the board order, performing urine drug tests, um, ensuring that they're going to their addiction psychiatry appointments, caduceus meetings, all aftercare requirements are being followed. So the monitors play a really big role in, in how we follow a licensee's compliance with the board order with regard to substance use and abuse.